I've been lucky enough to coach in Australia, England, South Africa and done stints in Europe and uh, Pacific Islands. And the Japanese players are completely unique, not like anywhere else in the world. And I think the players, whenever you coach rugby in a country, it's always reflective of the society uh, in some way. You know, for instance, the South Africans are very aggressive, physical people, you know, and the country's been been ruled by might for, for a number of years. So it's, it's part of the fabric of the society. Australians tend to be quite brash and arrogant, very inquisitive. You know, you ask them to do something and they say, why? You know, the difference with Japanese players, you ask them to do something and they just do it and they keep doing it regardless of what else happens. We'll go in with a game plan that we want to attack their number 10 and we'll do that and regardless of what happens out here, if there's space out here, we still won't go there. And then I'll say at half time, why didn't you go to the space? You told us to attack the 10. But if that space is open, we've got to go there. Oh, really? Yeah, you know, that's that's a conversation we have repeatedly. Yeah, you know, and it's all part of the, how they're educated, educated to be obedient. Yeah, you know, and that's that's a, that's a great thing in terms of of compliance, but not a great thing in a game where it's a decision making game. Like rugby's, yeah, you know, probably the most complex ball sport in the game. Yeah, you know, you've got serious contests for the ball all the time, either in a structured situation or, or an unstructured situation, which, which requires great decision making. And the Japanese players are not educated to be decision makers; they're educated to be obedient. But their their great strength, and, and more so than probably any other countries, is their resilience. You know, they've got a fantastic capacity for hard work, got a fantastic capacity to stick at things for long periods of time. But the, the downside is that, that lack of, of assertiveness. You know, they just want to, they want to please the coach. You know, so you have team meetings. No one, very rarely the players speak up because of the fact that you know, they don't want to be seen as, as, as being anything but compliant with what's going on. You know, and, and therefore, Running meetings in Japan is completely different from other countries because you have to have meetings before the meetings and meetings after the meetings to make sure that you've actually got compliance. Because, you know, Japanese players will have a passive compliance, but then they actually won't really do it with their heart. You know, they'll, they'll do what you say, but they won't do it with their heart. So you have to have meetings before the meeting and meetings after the meetings to make sure you get that, that real buy-in from the players. So it's quite, you know, it's a, it's quite a unique situation. And p- coaches who come to Japan think it's, you know, the the best place in the world because you've got these players who are going to work hard and do as you say. But yeah, you know, that only takes you so far. Yeah, you know? and one of the reasons Japan's never won a Test rug, never won a big game in Test rugby or won in the World Cup for twenty four years, I think, is that reason that. Yeah, you know, they they can't make decisions. They definitely can't make decisions under pressure. So the last, yeah, you know, the f- four years I've had with Japan, the first year coach very traditionally, and I had to had to do, create a base. But the second, third, and fourth year, we've increasingly given more responsibility to the players, and they're changing slowly. Yeah, you know, they still have days when they they just want to be obedient, just want to do what they tell you, what you ask them to do. But now we are getting much greater. Uh, thought process from the players. You know, they're thinking about what they should do, coming up with suggestions on on how they can do things better. So it's been a nice little process. And and again, you know, that's that's taken that's taken four years to get there. You can't you can't you've got to have a process to put this in place. But you know, if you look at Japan historically, since you know World War Two, you know my my father was in the occupation force here after World War Two, and the country was a mess. You know, they've got s- amazing capacity to do things. You know, and that's what I'm seeing with these players. They're, they're starting to break that shell of being passive, passive, obedient players and now starting to be assertive. I've had over the last two weeks at least three players come up to me and request to play. 
say, can you please pick me this week? I really want to play. I actually had one player I picked come and say, no, I can't play. My ankle's not good enough. I know I'm, it's not right. And, you know, for Japanese players to do that, that is quite amazing. Well, I've always found that, you know, the most successful teams I've had by your fourth year, your job is to, as a coach is to make yourself redundant. Hmm. You know, I look at it. I watch a little bit of NFL. I watch the Patriots sometimes. Like that Tom Brady runs the team, yeah. I'm sure the coach does a lot, but, yeah, you know, that's a very self, self-functioning self team. And most of the champion teams in the world are. Yeah, you know, the coach puts the framework in place, then creates the right leadership model for that team, and the players run it. Because once you're on the field, the players have got to run it. Yeah, you know, and particularly in rugby, where we don't have any intervention, so the game goes for two 40 minutes. We see the players once at half time during the game. So it's very much up to the players to, to find a way. And every time you play a game of rugby, when you get the ball, what's in front of you, the picture's different all the time. But you're right, you know, the job is to make, as a head coach, your job is to make yourself redundant. The game of rugby only went professionally, went, went professional in 1996. Mm. And the first year it went professional, I'd done some little bit of part-time work in Japan. And then this university, Tokai University, offered me a full-time job. And I was, I was quite, I was a, a principal in a high school in Australia. But I, but I had this dream of being a, a professional coach. So I, I came to Japan and, and my first experience was amazing. So I got to Tokai University. They were really weak, first division team, really weak. And I get there in the first two weeks, the captains runs everything. And I said to the, the Kantoku, I said, you know, you've employed me to be the head coach, but the captain does everything. And I said, you know, what's going on? He said, no, that's how we do things in Japan. <laughs> so I said, why do you want to coach for them? And, and it's, it's, that's, that's the ridiculous side of player leadership. You know, players aren't coaches. You know, coaches are there to make players do what they don't want to do. You know, that's our job. So you, you need players to be leaders, but at the university, the, the captain runs everything. And so the players don't get coached. So, you know, that was my first time learning about Japanese culture. So the next day I went in and said, look, here's my resignation letter. So I either become the coach or I go. It's, it's easy. And then, of course, the next day I, I, I ran things. As you've described the, uh, the players, they sound like typical Kai Shine. I meet with entrepreneurs all the yeah. time, independent thinking yeah. Japanese uh, entrepreneurs all the time who've never lived outside of or been outside mm. of Japan. There are, uh, call them misfits, call them whatever you'd like, but uh, uh, it would appear to me that independently minded people are uh, uh, generically born throughout the world yeah. in equal amounts. Yeah. Uh, is perhaps the selection process for team members here in Japan uh, uh, is the wrong selection process? What's your hundred percent? It was interesting. I was just I met yesterday morning with the, the coaching director of Japanese Rugby Union, and he's now head coach of the twenties. And he said, and I said, one of the things you've got to sort out in Japan is from the age, you know, you pick national teams from 17, 18 and 20 and you find the bulk of those players will go through to be your national team players because they get the better coaching, get better exposure to international sport. So once you're selected in those teams, it's very hard to get out. But what they do, the selection process is all about at 17 and 18, they pick the most obedient boys, the boys that are going to work hard, say yes, do the right thing. They don't... They tend to stray away from those guys who are a bit more liberal thinking, do their own thing, you know, break the mould. Japanese sport doesn't cope with those players. Right. Yeah, so and, is, and, there, is there anything that you, you... Is there anything within your power that you've been able to do to attract well, players? Is that within the realm of a coach to uh, well, select only, players? The only thing I've, I've done is spoken to those coaches and encouraged them to to change their selection process. And I know, you know, we've picked players in our squad now that wouldn't have been picked normally. You know, we've got a boy, Tumra, from 
major university, you know, he's a, he's a completely different, you know, he's a bit of a renegade, but he's exactly what we want because he's a bit independent. You know, but traditionally Japanese coaches stray away from that. And I, I coached in Suntory before I came here and it was the same. You know, before I took over, they'd always pick the guys who'd work hard, do the right thing. No, he deserves a chance rather than someone who, who was a bit more independent. So it's it's almost, you know, and sport in Japan, you've got to remember how it regenerated itself after World War, World War II. It was based on military discipline. You know, it was based on work hard, keep doing the right thing and, and you'll get rewards. You know, it wasn't about being creative and being assertive. Yeah, you know, and sport's always a combination, I'm sure business is. You know, it's a combination of hard work and, and being creative and, and finding a different way to do things. And in Japanese sport, it's probably, it's been, well, no, it hasn't, probably it has. It's been all about hard work and discipline, nothing about being creative and finding a way to do things. Right. Japanese players are like factory workers. You know, they go up, all the teams go up to a bushery in, in Hokkaido for a pre season camp. You know, and, and that should be one of the most fun times you have. You know, you're up in camp, you're in a nice spot. And I watch these, I stay at this hotel and I watch these players every morning. They get out of the hotel and they walk to training like this. Yeah, you know, like they're death warmed up. <laughs> yeah, you know, because they, they, they just see it as work. They don't see it. Like, yeah, you know, you've got to... The whole thing about sports, sports recreation, and recreation means to recreate. Yeah, you know, it means to have enjoyment. You've got to play sport with some love in your heart. Yeah, you know, if you play it just as a, as a duty, you never get 100% passion or commitment in, in how you play. And again, tradition, that's why I've seen Japanese teams not do well at the World Cup. Because, you know, World Cup's about nationalism. You know, it's, it's like the Olympics. You know, they're just normal sports events, but, but you know, you do, you've got a chance to do something for your country. And that's where, you know, national pride comes in. And if you're doing it out of duty, you don't, you don't get that rise to the next level. Mm. Japanese players want to train to please you. So one of the things we did at a, at a previous camp this year players came to training I can see they weren't they weren't quite there so I got them to do the warm-up and then I got them and I said boys you're not going to train today it's, it's off we're not training and I've never seen players so I've never seen them so upset they were really upset and you know getting delegations of players coming to you got to let us train we must train I said no you're not training and they were so upset and angry so I got that emotional result I wanted but the reason they were angry is because they felt like they weren't fulfilling their duty rather than train. You know, training's about improvement. Every time you go to training, it's a chance to improve. It's not about duty. It's a chance to improve. Yeah, so that's, that's still there for the players. Mm. You know, training to me is a privilege. Mm. So, you know, playing a game of rugby, playing a country game for your country is an absolute privilege. And you've got to see it like that. And, and we're slowly getting a better response. Mm. It's very difficult. You know, so Japan, to, to keep going in international rugby and, and be further successful, the whole development process has to change. And, and again, it goes back to that training out of duty. It's got to be training about being specialised. Because Japanese, like any, any business, you've got to have a competitive edge. So if you can't be as fit... Fit in it. it can't be as big as and strong as them. Then you've got to be faster and more skillful, right? You know, and and uh, so it needs to change at an early age, though. Yeah, you know, because in rugby, rugby is the most physical game in the world, so you never get away from physical contests. But you, there's ways to win, but you've got to be smart and you've got to be quick. So it goes back again, smart players are players who make decisions quickly. Not necessarily think a lot, mm. they make decisions quickly. Mm. So the whole structured Japanese rugby sets them, to be, sets them out to be dull, mm. not bright. Have you accomplished um, over the last four years, three years, what you've wanted to accomplish? Or do you feel... Well, yeah, I think when you create a team, the... The dynamics of a team are never, you, from one day to another, changes. 
Yeah, you can. The team, like at the moment, our team's in really good fettle. Really good fettle. We have one guy, maybe a senior guy. If, for example, last night he has a fight with his girlfriend or his wife, comes in today and and not quite there, the not, dynamics of the team can change. Yeah, it's what it's one of the most interesting things of coaching. So you know, you, you've got this living organism that that keeps on changing all the time. Yeah, I think generally speaking, we're going in the right direction. It's a matter of whether we're going quick enough in that right direction. You know, I see the players, as I said, are more assertive. They're more uh, adaptive making decisions, and they want to make decisions. Um, but whether we've got there quick enough, I'm not sure. And, and you know, ultimately. You know, our, our stock results are in the World Cup. We'll find out where our stock is in the world. Mm-hmm.